Yeah, welcome. This is the Paul Business Lab. Um, it's just a platform for people in Paul and Wellington, uh, entrepreneurs, to network with each other, uh, learn from other people that have these journeys uh, through their life already. Those of you that are here for the first time, I think this is probably the fourth or fifth lab that we're having. And what we do here is we invite people that um, are business, that have their own businesses, people that are entrepreneurs. And um, during lockdown, there are a lot of people that started their own businesses or forced to start their own businesses or uh, uh, landed up in situations where they want to or they have opportunity to start their own business. Um, and yeah, we learn from those people's uh, lessons and uh, journeys. And of course, tonight we have one of those guys that um, I'm, I've, I've chatted to Chad previously. Um, so what who Chad is, Chad, used to be or is still a medical doctor. Um, he then jumped ship and then he decided to follow his own journey to become an entrepreneur. Um, he had a nice journey last year with a company. We're going to hear a bit about it um, during the COVID period. A lot of companies uh, struggled a bit over COVID, but it looked like Chad did, uh, he did the other way. Um, yeah, so basically uh, what I would, would have liked for Chad to walk down here and you guys give a round of applause, but we'll leave that for the, <laughs> the Oprah please, show. No. But Chad, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks, dude. Welcome. I see you had to come all the way from Cape Town. I, Literally. Yeah, I know uh, entrepreneurs and business people are very busy. So um, thanks so much for your time. That's and, a pleasure. Uh, That's welcome, a big pleasure. Welcome back to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it has been, I feel like I haven't been here in a while actually. Yeah. Um, I remember I came here two years ago. Yeah, two years yeah. ago, yeah. We did the when I started the initial yeah. initial business here. Yeah, yeah I so I mean um we are off the bat. I normally ask people, um, yeah, how did you how did you get your job and what what, what are you doing? <laughs> um I come up with stories for the living. That's okay. what I do. I tell stories, I come up with ways in which we can you know, create a vision of something in the future and a life that I'm trying to live towards. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what I do these days. Okay. As a, um, so I, I um, left school, I finished school in 2011 at Paul Boys High and um, started studying medicine at Stellenbosch in 2012. And um, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time at Stellenbosch. Uh, within my first year, I already realized, you know, maybe clinical medicine is not for me. Um, but I also understood the value, you know, in, in, in getting a degree and having um, a good education. And I was fortunate enough, my parents, they, they did their best to get me through. And um, yeah, I finished, I finished med school in 2016, 17, 17. And I started working as a doctor for two, at uh, Vista for two years, Vista Hospital. Um, but literally from third year, I started studying why healthcare is wrong. Mm. Like what's wrong with healthcare? And I started realizing that we've got so many inherent issues um, that I just became a student of it. And um, I had a lot of fights at, at, at work with colleagues. You know, you butt heads when you have different opinions and visions. You know, if I say, for example, um, we should do something in X, Y, and then they say, no, but Y is the way to do it. And then there's never really a, an agreement there. But um, I stuck through the internship and things, and um, ach, there were a few hurdles here, you know, the mental health mm. and all in, along the way. But in 2018, I decided that I'm going to start, you know, I really want to be an entrepreneur and I want to yeah. start my own company. And um, yeah, that's when we actually came up with the idea of the company initially. Yeah. <laughs> the whole premise of the company was to bring smart technology from abroad and package it in an affordable way and sell it to our market. Mm. Um, and that was the initial idea, but uh, as things go, nothing's, you know, entrepreneurship is, is literally like a whirlwind, mm -hmm. so you'll know as well. So as soon as you, you, you start, you hit the ground running, and I think I learned, <laughs> I learned so many lessons in the last three years, it's not even funny, yeah. but um, I, I quickly realized what my core focus should be, mm -hmm. and that's healthcare. Yeah. So, so I've, I've refocused my, all my energy um, to healthcare now. Okay. So, so. Okay. So let's just take a uh, let's take a step back quickly. So normally, normally when you grow up in a house where there's a lot of business talk at the table, or yeah. the, your father has his own business, yeah. and my friend's father's got a business, he's been standing behind the till since 11 years old. There's always that it's an automatic uh, progression of becoming 
in business. So mm. what was the childhood like? Was that conversation at the table or was it? Not, not so much. Okay. Um, my, my sort of um, image that I had uh, from, from you know, growing up was this idea of, you know, you've got to work for the government mm. and, and all these things. But my father always ran his school, he was a principal, mm. Literally like a business. Okay. So mm. it was, for example, it was a school that didn't, it didn't get any funding. Mm. So he was good at getting funding and, um, you know, setting it up in such a way that it's, it's, it stands out in the area that it was in, which was a very impoverished area. So he's, he was somewhat of an of a, of a, um, inspiration in that sense. Okay. Right? He always did things opposite to the way it should be done. And I think that's kind of where I probably started you know, g gaining that um, insight because, um, and he, you know, it was the work ethic that he had and all of that. So I guess that he, n he wasn't a standard teacher or yeah. standard principal. He yeah. it always did things differently. So that was probably one of the key, but, but also what I did was, um, while I was growing up in, in school and all, so where I grew up in Paul East, there, I mean, there's not really that much sort of aspirationally to look at there. You know, people tend to, be very complacent and the, um, the LSM is pretty low and all of that. But what I did was, because so I was at Paul Boys Eye, and what I did was I focused on what my um, friends' parents were doing. Mm. So they often, um, if you look at Paul, it's got the separation with the river and all, but on the one end, the, the income is higher, but the basic, or the, the education level might not be as high as the other end. So on, our, on the colored side of Paul, like they used to say, the education level was like everyone had some form of a tertiary, be it a diploma or degree or whatever, but the income level was incredibly low. And that for me, I was like, it doesn't make sense. Like why? Everyone's telling you, go get a degree, go get a, you know, go work and everything. And then you realize that the, 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 the key gap there was the fact that um, we were never skilled or, or taught or yeah. nurtured in financial literacy, you know, yeah. selling. I mean, yeah. if you sell, you live, if you can sell something, you can survive. Yeah. And like, so that is the, the, what we, I mean, we weren't on naturally taught. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I really studied them and I saw a lot of them. <laughs> My friend's parents had shops and they had, uh, one had a gym or one had, you know, made wine or mm. something like that. So always some form of revenue generating yeah. thing that they were doing. And then I realized, well, that's probably mm. what I want to go and do. Um, because the prosperity that comes from that is not just for the family. I mean, it's, for, it, it's immediately, it's, it's, it's for, for generations. Mm, so, mm. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was sort of growing up what I, what I focused on when I was smaller through school. Uh, but then when it came to um, varsity and things, mm. I just started reading. I yeah. just read. Miles, I read a shitload. Mm. Like, I, yeah. I read a lot. Yeah. I would read, you can ask my wife, I, I read, like, I, I, I'm like a vacuum cleaner. Mm. Anything I can find that's related to business, I mean, I'm just bought today. I just went online and I bought like too much, too many. <laughs> um, I bought books on AI and healthcare. Yeah. And I just find it and I'm like, that's what I want to study now. And I just go. Mm. And so I just consumed a lot of information and I studied the guys, the Elon Musk of the world. I studied them. I studied um, Peter Thiel. I studied, you know, zero to one. I, I just, I went and made an effort to learn the way in which these guys have built things from scratch and mm. scaled it. And a, a lot of that was, was um, difficult because you're often not surrounded by people who think that way. Mm. So my, my business partner now actually says to me, like, you, are in, like, you sound like a crazy person. Yeah. Like, because you just <laughs> fought things out yeah. all the time. Yeah. And like, <laughs> you, it, it, it feels like there's no control of yeah. what you're thinking about because yeah. you, 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 um, you study these people and you realize you have to create a future version of the world you're living in now yeah. and work towards that future version of that, mm. of that world. Mm. And it's difficult to, to have that conversation with a lot of people. No, no, 100%. So, um, so um, yeah. yeah no, so, so tell me when, when, what happened that you decided, okay, this, this entrepreneur thing is something for me. What was the first thing you sold? What was that first thing that triggered and said, okay, maybe I'm, I, I don't mm. like the selling part, or maybe I like the selling part, I can do this. I don't love the selling part, I'll be very honest with you, yeah. it's not my favorite part of entrepreneurship, but I think what, I, the first thing I ever sold, I remember we used to have in grade three and grade four, we used to have um, entrepreneurship day, yeah. and my mom used to make those chocolate things for mm. me. Um, chocolate brownies. No, no, what was oh. it, those, um, 
the molds, man, like the chocolate molds that you okay. put in like a bunny or like a, a okay. heart or something. That was like the first thing I used to, we, we sold and I used yeah. to get so excited for entrepreneurship. Okay. That was like my favorite day over there. And um, then through, va through school, I sold um, diet plans at yeah. some point. I worked because I lost a lot of weight during school. I was quite big. I'm a bit big again, but I'm getting there. Yeah. Um, so I, I lost quite a bit of weight and I started making meal plans okay. and I sold it for like 250 rand a plan. Okay. Completely untrained, but I yeah. knew it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I always just found things. Oh, I used to sell CDs. Like, yeah. So I just enjoyed making something and then giving it to someone else. Be like, yeah. okay, then they find value in what I give them. Yeah. I like that. Okay. And then through Varsity, I was a DJ. My whole Varsity, throughout Varsity. What I, was your DJ name? Just Chad. <laughs> I oh, was okay. just Chad. Okay. Just I DJed for six years um, at campus and campus parties and okay. things. And um, yeah, I just sold things. I mean, I sold e headphones at some point. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's I just been always been. But I think from the entrepreneur side, like as, as, as important as the selling part of it is, I think the, I, I just believe that as an entrepreneur, you're, you're literally your job is, is to tell stories, man. Okay. I, I've, I've, I've concluded that over my, it's not been a, like an illustrious career. It's yeah. been like three years of being an entrepreneur. But I've accepted now that it's, it's less Excel and more PowerPoint, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, the goal for me every single day is to wake up and say, like, this is where I think this thing must go. Yeah. And I, I then sit back and I, and I feed off things and I search for things and I use those things to... And luckily, I've got a partner that, that really understands me. Yeah. So I will take all of it and say, yeah. yeah. And then you will go and say, okay, that's cool. Mm. But now you need to structure it. Mm. So, so it's really about vision. Mm. It's, it's, it's just now about, that's for me what entrepreneurship is about. Yeah. It's about having a vision and giving a vision to something. Mm. Mm. And, and pulling people together to make it happen. Okay. Yeah. okay, so tell me a bit about, so last year was... Like some people don't count last year as a year in their lives, but yeah. I mean, so probably totally opposite for you. So tell us a bit about um, just the nanotech, the mm. nano, the idea behind that, the successes, the lessons. Sure. So, um, so yeah, so, so a lot of NanoWave was, I, I, I look at NanoWave as, a, as my first off-taker product. Mm. Like that was the first product that really gave me the opportunity to experience um, the good, the bad, the ugly, mm. everything that there possibly is about entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I experienced it in a year. So we had before, so 2019, mm. uh, we had a few products on the market as, as Wave as it was then. So we had um, the Media Box, which is the Android Media Box, which sold quite well. We just used e-commerce platforms yeah. and that sold quite well. Then we had our smartwatches. Mm. So for me, the smartwatches were very important for me because it was, for me, a step in the healthcare direction. Yeah. So when it comes to things like, and this was 2018, 2019, I really wanted to make smart wearables commonplace yeah. because not everyone can afford an Apple Watch, not everyone can afford a Galaxy, whatever, whatever. So you want to give something that is low cost, yeah. but does the important thing. So yeah. I focused, I remember I, I had, um, I wanted the watch to do your heart rate, your blood pressure, your steps, your calories, and your basic notifications. Yeah. And now when I look at it, it maybe was a little bit too early, but, oh, and it also did your saturation. So, so those are the key things I wanted it to do at the time um, because I felt like you are empowering the individual by giving them visibility of the, of the yeah. basic metrics. Yeah. And, and most people d didn't care about that, especially the LSM I was targeting. So if you've got a discovery medical aid, you probably kind of know that already. So it was more slightly lower LSM, but just to introduce them to it. Yeah. So that sold quite well. And then as the year drew down in 2019, I was studying obviously what's going on in the world and uh, obviously try to keep, keep ahead of things. And one of our factories actually said to us, um, no guys, there's this, um, this thing in China and it's, it's causing problems and they're locking things down. And, and I was like, okay, fine. But at this time, um, as the story goes, we were already working, well, me as a healthcare professional, I hated wearing a mask. Yeah. And towards the end of 2019, I was really thinking of ways in which we could make mask wearing more bearable. Yeah. Because I honestly did not want to wear a mask in hospital mm. because of the material and all these things. Anyway, so then we started engaging some factories and we found a factory that could manufacture masks for us of the specific material and the specific design. And um, we just bought a few just to see. And we just, you know, engaged with them and all. 
But there weren't like clear plans to like, okay, we're going to launch this thing now. So as the year drew down, um, the one factory in, in, in Guangzhou shut down completely. And they said, no, no, we have to close down because it's, a, it's this thing is spreading. Yeah. So basic epidemiological principles tell you that if an area the size of China decides to lock down, it means that they are, it's already too late. Mm. Right? They've already experienced the fact that there's been some form of an outbreak distal to where this area is. Yeah. So I looked at it and I was like, okay, fine, if that's the start, then it's probably going to spread. And um, yeah, at that time it wasn't a big deal. Everyone was like making fun of COVID yeah, of and stuff. What's happening and, in China? Uh, yeah, people <laughs> were literally just making jokes about it and everything. And I, we then decided, um, this was in Jan, yeah, Jan. We decided we need to, we need to, we need, people are going to need masks. Mm. But at this time, no one knew and no one believed that we would need masks. And here again, the, the concept for me of being visionary and thinking about the future mm. comes, comes into play. Because mm. if you look at a blank piece of paper and you decide, okay, this is what it's going to look like in five months, mm. who the hell knows? Yeah. No one knows. But you have to be confident in your, in your, in your sort of research and your beliefs yeah. that this is what it's going to look like. Yeah. And we then, I just decided with my, with my then partner, and I said to him, let's do it, man. Let's, let's, let's bring these masks in and let's, let's, let's design it and get it going. And we didn't have money, we didn't have enough money. Um, all the revenues from the previous year mm. we spent because we were now going to bring in more stock and things. And uh, I woke up on a Monday morning, made a few phone calls, drove around, raised 200,000 rand, literally, sure, just from give me, driving around. Give me those numbers. <laughs> And pitched it to one of the, like, I think I pitched it to 10 people. Yeah. I think three people came and said, okay, cool, we'll help you. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I came home with, with enough money to buy the first batch of stock. Wow. And uh, we only had enough to buy 5,000 units. We then placed an order for 10,000 units. Uh, we opened the pre-orders and then absolute chaos ensued after that. Mm. Because then mm. we had now created the brand and we created this thing. And um, <laughs> we, it was literally towards... The end of uh, um, Feb and Cyril just lo he, as yeah. we placed the order, yeah. Cyril locked down on that Thursday. I think it was the 30th of March. Yeah. Yeah. Cyril locked down and, and we had promised people, you're going to get your things yeah. because we, we, we have to deliver. And then it was just an absolute shambles yeah. because then logistics, global logistics was completely out of sync. Mm. Local logistics was mm. non-existent. Mm. Um, it, was, it, was, it was insane. And, we, and then I realized where um, this entrepreneurship, the, the spirit of entrepreneurship comes in because as a, as a professional person, right, what I've experienced, if you've got a degree or you've got whatever, you, people tend to believe, no, no, they're above certain things. Mm. You see, and, and for me, I, I thought about it and, and you have to literally... You can't have an ego as an entrepreneur. Mm. Mm. Like, I'm going to say it. Sometimes you just eat shit mm. as an entrepreneur. That's yeah. literally how it is. Yeah. And, and you have to sometimes be willing to just lay on the floor mm. and people will step over you. Mm. And it's fine. They step over you, you just look and be like, fine, I'm not, I can still walk and you get up again. Yeah. So at some point we were flying to Joburg, banging on doors to get our stock, trying to track the stock. Mm. And it was, it was, um, it was probably... The, one of the most stressful periods I've ever, ever had. Wow. I was getting three minutes phone, every three minutes a phone call. Where's my stuff? Where's our stuff? It was 10,000 units we had to get out. And we were effectively two people at the time. And yeah. then we brought in some more people to assist. So everything was, sorry, everything was sold on the e-commerce platform? Completely sold out in two days. Wow. Yeah, literally. And, and again, it was just of us basically creating this hype around this mm. product, mm. which we basically convinced people that it will be the product you're going to need yeah. once, you, once COVID. Look, it was, a, I think in entrepreneurship, you must never underestimate the, the, the value of good fortune and luck. Mm. Sometimes any entrepreneur looks at you and says, no, nah, it's all hard work. It's, all, it's nonsense. Mm. It's not true. If you study any, any big, like proper successful Fortune 500, NASDAQ listed, top three country, company, they'll all tell you that there was an element of luck involved. And that is just sometimes what it is. And you just have to be in the right place at the right time. And, and, and be, you must just be willing to capitalize on opportunity. Mm. So, um, yeah, so that happened. And, and after we had sold these out and we eventually delivered everything to everyone we roped in, I mean, it was like a... The garage at home was yeah. full of masks and we were just boxing things and packaging things and 
we basically created things on the fly to make it work. So, I mean, how are we delivering? This is like a national thing. That this was all, I and mean, we, 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 we um, set up an agreement with the courier guy. We paid them nothing initially, yeah. and we just let them, we just said, guys, I need you to help mm. me get this stuff to everyone in the country. And this was always in Durban, Joburg. I was wow. tacking things on my phone. It was insane, and I realized I never want to do this again, but yeah. this was what <laughs> happened. And that was my first key lesson, and I actually realized then and there that I do not want to sell to people. I do not want to be the person selling to the other person. And then I realized I want to, do a, I want to become a B2B business. You know, that's okay. sort of my model that I want to, okay. that I want to do. And since then, I've, I've, and I've really now decided that that's what I want to do. Yeah. Anyway, so then after those, went out, made a few phone calls, and um, a company from Joburg f saw the moss, and they liked it. And it's a big company, corporate-type company, and um, very well-established. And they contacted us through, a, through someone I knew and um, had the introduction. And then they said, guys, we can make this thing big. Wow. And um, then I realized the value of distribution, like distribution mm. and actual proper distributors mm. that are focused and good yeah. at what they do. And we signed exclusivity with them at the time uh, for that specific version of the mask at that time yeah. um, with uh, our company in China specifically. Yeah. And... Um, we then started working with them. And uh, look, they didn't have necessarily have exclusivity with our local company, yeah. uh, but uh, we, we gave them rights to, mm. to move. And they proved themselves. They did sell well. But no, so, so just tell me something. So you get a phone call from a distributor. Oh, I mean, like when you start your own thing, you, <laughs> have your, you, you start your, a lot of big businesses come to you yeah. with gold in the hand and say, yeah. Yeah, it's a dangling carrot. I mean, what, how do you go about Deciding, okay, these people are genuine. I mean, do you do a, or is it just a feel that you have, guys, we're at the point now, this is where we can make it, and then you just go with it, or do you really <laughs> like think about this? Because it happens to entrepreneurs, you start something, someone knocks on the door, they no, say, of course. yes, whatever you want. Look, at that time, it was, it was, we didn't have, you know, in chess, eh, like you look at your chess board sometimes and you're like, you I only have one option here yeah. now, and sometimes you just have to take the, okay. take the risk. So, but it's, very, it's easy to spot the bullshitter mm. very quickly. Um, that's mm. something I've learned also over the, over mm. the past two years. Um, uh, but we, yeah, no, we just, it's, it was just a gut feeling, I okay. guess, at the time. We're like, guys, okay, we're going to go with you guys. Yeah. And we, we started, and it was also, I mean, nothing was a given. It was mm. all a lot of grafting and, yeah. and um, like, every day doing, the, doing what we had to do. Uh, I focused, uh, so being the doctor at the th within that space was useful because mm. I had the background on, on healthcare and I had the background on, on medicine and all, and, and um, I was able to engage at a very high level with mm. various stakeholders. Yeah. So I could say, yeah. I could engage with um, a CEO of a hospital yeah. and be like, listen, this is, this is what it is. And okay. so, so that was useful. And um, at that time, we were working very closely with our distributor, and I was very much involved with the nuts and bolts of um, the operations. And I didn't particularly enjoy it because, um, like I said, my, my, my role and my position is more uh, creation and, yeah. and vision and all. Yeah. And uh, at some point, I did step back a little bit, but initially, we were so engaged with them, and, and we basically strategized how we would make this thing work under the circumstances. I mean, yeah. COVID, that time, between uh, um, hard lockdown and level three, that was completely unprecedented. Mm. Who knew what they had to do in that time? Nothing worked, nothing was normal. Mm. Um, it was like force my year, basically, the whole time. And um, um, I mean, when Cyril introduced the levels of, of where people will go back to work, so we engaged the people from level one at the time, who were probably only gonna work in September, October, November, and we, we said to them, let's, sign all of you guys up as agents or as distributors or, or resellers through our distributor. Okay. And uh, he, they managed it, but, but the, the vision sort of, we, we came up with that together. And we employed about a thousand people at some wow. point through that lockdown period. And um, yeah, the, we basically saved, I mean, a couple of hundred businesses during that time just and by this, giving them something to sell. And this is purely masks. This was all nano So wow. it was funny because <clears throat> during that time, you know, there's a lot of white noise in the world and a lot, yeah. of, and a lot of distractions in life and yeah. things. So during that time, it was obviously like a PPE rush. Mm. PPE was like, it was like gold. Mm. Like tenders. Like it was insane. And it, and it, 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 it really, I, the stuff like that doesn't sit well with me. Mm. I like it to be, it must just, it must be a certain way. Mm. 
and we were doing quotes and we were chasing this and chasing that. And I actually just said to my partner at the time, I said to him, dude, just forget that stuff. Let's just ignore that and focus on building the nanowave thing. And I mean, that worked at the time because it helped us um, solidify the brand. Um, and then we, we landed the Diskim. So Diskim came on board again through our distributor, which is why I emphasize how important it is to actually have a very good distributor. Yeah. Um, you know, not, they're not perfect, no one's perfect, but at least they, they um, deliver, you know, when they wonder what they say they're gonna do. So, what, so I mean, what's going, you and your partner, they give you a call, they say the scheme's on board, I mean, it's almost like yeah, I, I it was, or was it like? It was, it was a bit of, um, look, there's obviously a bit of selling involved, so, yeah. so <clears throat> I realized also during this time that a good product is like one-tenth of the thing. It has to be a solid business case, and it has to make sense as a business uh, trans transaction. And we made it make sense for this game, yeah. in, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so this game wanted sort of you know, exclusivity for the pharmacies and things. And um, we basically just engaged them and um, sent a few samples and you know, had one or two back and forth engagements, yeah. and they placed their first order. Wow. And, and uh, the distributor, again, did very well, got the correct branding, brand ambassadors on, in, involved. Uh, Victor Matchfield and all of them, and, and they became the face of, of, of NanoWave. Yeah. It, was, it was very sport orientated, okay. um, family orientated yeah. Yeah, during that time. Oh, nice, um, but one of the most challenging things that I had during that period was um, educating um, people from other industries to sell something they know nothing about. So they would sell, um, it's like telling a car salesman, in theory, he can sell. But you can't tell him to go sell sneakers. Yeah. So you almost have to now re -edu like, educate these people on what they can and can't say. Because mm -hmm. now you oversell things and you undersell things. And yeah. So that was probably quite a, one of the bigger challenges I had during that time. Um, you know, being in charge of all of this and yeah. everything. So, and and you always, I've always, I'm always the youngest. So now you're getting, I'm 27 now. Yeah. I get calls from 60-year-olds, 50-year-olds long-standing businessman, mm. I'm a snot light. what do I tell them? Yeah. But you have to be assertive in a way to make sure that they can understand, no, 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 this boy is not playing around, yeah, yeah. he's serious, um, you know, engage with him respectfully, and it's always, always respectful towards the, the, the people that have been doing it for longer. Um, so, so, yeah, that was probably one of the biggest challenges yeah. I had. And yeah. Okay, so you, like you said, last year you learned a lot of lessons in entrepreneurship. Give me what, what are the top three lessons. Top three lessons. Yeah. Okay, there are the ten. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, I think the first for me, if I had to put it in an, in, in an order, you know, like m most important to least important, not that there are any non important yeah. lessons, but I think the most important lesson is believing in your own um, vision about what something should be. Okay. Right and 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 just believing in it without no one must be able to sh like like move you on, on 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 that thing. You you need to be able to stand there and a tidal wave must hit you, mm. and you must the tidal wave must go straight over and you must still be standing there. And say, I believe in this product and this is what it's doing. And but at the same time, as much as you believe in your thing, be open to pivoting and changing mm. and shifting and mm. and and. You, that is, that is, I think, where a lot of entrepreneurs fail because they, they become so, because it's, it's always taught, now you must be believing in your thing, but your thing might be wrong. Yeah. It might be stupid. Yeah. So if someone else comes in and has a better or a different approach, listen to the person and say, okay, let's, let's entertain that, potentially doing that thing. Okay. So that, I think, was a, that balance yeah. is a lesson to learn. Like you, the only way you learn that balance is being in it. Yeah. So, so it's like, don't become over obsessed with your idea. Completely. Yeah. If if tomorrow if if you can't look three months down the line and say, or oh, you've gone in this thing for X amount of time and you, and it's still not working, mm. yes, you must. Like if you look at Elon Musk, people told Elon Musk, Kevin O'Leary was gonna. They pitched Tesla to him in the beginning, and he literally said to him, "You're stupid. Yeah. It's not gonna work." Fair enough. Mm. But he still had that bigger vision. But a lot of stuff happened in between. Mm. But the big vision at the end of the day was still to electrify cars mm. and electrify transport. Mm. So in the same way with me, Nanowave was one of those things where I, it was my first step into changing healthcare. 
and changing what we do in healthcare and how we do things in healthcare. Mm. Even though it didn't maybe at the time look like it, yeah. but it, it, it was. Um, <clears throat> and second then, lesson. Second lesson. <clears throat> um, yo, this is a big one. Prioritize your health. Mm. Okay. I, I, let, I let that slip last year completely. I was so, so everyone says to me, hey, it's such a good year, you know, you mm. must have been. I said, guys, it might have looked like that from the outside, but I was dying on the inside. Mm. I left <clears throat> medicine because of mental health things, mm. like, you know, the depression and things. And um, I had gone through an episode the year before. Mm. And the more I focused on the business, the more I felt better because now I'm doing the thing I love and everything. But even the thing you love can become toxic. Yeah, of course, yeah. So um, I... I let my health slip, I, I wasn't eating well, I wasn't sleeping, I, I was working, if you can ask my wife, I was probably working 25, 26 hours a day. Mm. Not that necessarily sitting there working, but yeah. your brain is working non -stop. You don't switch off. You don't switch off. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I think, I think you almost have to, my wife actually said something very interesting to me the other day, so we were driving home from, I can't remember where, where were we driving from? I can't remember. So we're driving home. Oh, we drove from Paul. So we came to visit my parents. And she's been playing Sudoku a lot now. Okay. <clears throat> and she says to me, um, yo, you know, babe, I realized something so cool about Sudoku. And I'm like, okay, what did you, what is the thing about Sudoku? <laughs> <laughs> so then she's like, no, if I focus on one block mm. in the game and I get that block as close to perfect, mm. if you look to the left or the right, it usually will just take one more thing to make the other thing work. Yeah. And I thought about it, and I was like, that is so brutal. <laughs> like, and she was post-call. She just came from yeah. like a 30-hour shift at hospital. And I'm like, are you drunk? Like, <laughs> where are you getting this information? Yeah. And then she showed me, and she's like, no, look here. I just got this square right. Okay. And look at this. If I look at this square, I just need to put this number in there. And then it works. And I literally, you know, that, that thing's been sitting on my head since she told me. Yeah. And uh, since she told me that, I, I actually then went through a whole flip and I just refocused my energy on getting healthy again. Yeah. So I literally, and my business partner as well, he's been on this journey also now with the healthcare and things. And he's been motivating me and things. And I just decided now I need to focus on my health. And yeah. 2020 was probably one of my most unhealthy years uh, in so all. Is this, in, pure, is this purely um, mental health or is it like fitness? Mental, well, fitness, okay. Alice. It was one of those very difficult years, even though it looked like it was going great. Yeah. Um, but it was a challenging I mean, yeah, it's, it's so, it's like you're saying, like you, every, like you, it's, it's like when you, on Instagram, on social media, yeah. everything. Looks but, nice. But in actual, in reality. Yeah. So I actually deactivated again now, went off the social media and things, because that stuff is so toxic. Um, you just expose yourself to so many things. Mm. And, and, you know, it's, it's sad, like you live, in a, you live in a world now where nothing is real. Mm. So... All of that happened last year, and I just realized I need to focus on my, my health. Yeah. Um, and then I think the third, the third thing is probably, yeah. Okay, but how did you, how did you fix the mental health part? I mean, how so did the you? So, what did you do? Like, I mean. I was just very selective of who I surrounded myself with. Okay. That, that's probably the answer there. So, you need to protect your energy. Yeah. That's, that's probably the, the best way to answer that question. Okay. So that, that, that means, you know, whatever it needs to mean. Yeah, so, your circle. So, um, correct. So, so I think that's a, you, that's a very important part. And you don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to feel bad about protecting what, you know, your, your, what you value is, your energy and all. Mm. Um, and that was a big shift. It wasn't easy. It's still not easy. Yeah. It's, it's still a battle every day. But um, I've now literally focused like wholeheartedly on becoming healthy again. And it's been the best decision. I mean, I'm exercising every single day. I'm lifting heavy weights every day. Nice. I'm preparing my meals for the week in advance. Yeah. I'm sleeping adequately. Mm. Um, all, those, all those preventative things, which is also ties very nicely into you know, the company that I'm building at the moment, mm. which has a very strong focus on preventative healthcare and okay. things. So, okay. so yeah, so. <clears throat> um, yeah, before you get to the third one, how important is like, yeah, I mean, how important is family support, wife yeah. support, I mean, your circle? So I was going to get to that now as number three, actually. Yeah. So, so I, <clears throat> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself successful mm. at the moment. That's not something, I, I mean, success is uh, various definitions and everything. But um, for me, 
in the times I've been successful and you know things have gone well and things don't go whatever whatever you want to call it. But for me, success is is is, is a everyday thing. Yeah. So so um, f to reach that continuous state of success or whatever, you need support. So when you're an entrepreneur and you know yourself starting jump and drop and everything like. If you have any form of negativity coming your way, it, you, you don't want to be around Suntu. it. Just Suntu. Yeah. Kanala. Yes. <laughs> so that is, that, is exactly, that is exactly what it is as an yeah. entrepreneur. When no one else, you know, no, no one is going to, I'm not saying people must be like, oh, you know, mm. then, you must not, then you mustn't be an entrepreneur. Mm. That's not the case. Mm. But you do need strong support yeah. where you can, people just encourage you. Yeah and solidify your beliefs like no no chat keep going or miles you know yeah it, it will be fine and all because the reality is it's incredibly difficult it is incredibly difficult to be an entrepreneur yeah. and there's a reason why such a small percentage of people do it yeah um so i think support and 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 having you know i i love like my wife is like mm. my like beginning and end of of things for me so um she she's one of the most intelligent um, driven, motivated, hardworking people I've ever, you know, obviously met. And, um, no, like, she, she's always the one that, you know, in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day will just, you know, tap you on your shoulder and say you're doing well. Or, you know, that kind of, And, that, like, you can't replace yeah, that. Yeah, There's nothing that you yeah. can say that will make that. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah, so I definitely think having that okay. support structure there is... Okay. Is, uh. Acknowledgement. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, was there, ever, was there ever time, so you say you've been this entrepreneur for three years, was there ever time where you wanted to say, I'm done with this, I'm going back to medicine because yeah, uh, it's, it's not working for me? Yes. But it's funny, though, you know, you, you say that, but, but I actually thought about it and I said to myself, the day I get to that point is the day I've given up. Mm. You know, no, there's not a single bone in my body that says, I need to go back and become a, a practicing doctor. Yeah. Not a single bone. Because I know that my purpose here is, 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 is it involves that, yeah. but it is not that. So um, we, we laugh about it sometimes at the office also, and like, ah, oh, like, my partner's going to go back to corporate or whatever. But the reality <laughs> is that that is, that is the point of giving up. Yeah. And um, when people say to you, no, but because that's a safe option, is to do that. But none of us, or cut from that cloth, mm. like we just aren't, that's not who we are. Yeah. You'll end up depressed and lonely uh, three months later yeah, again. Yeah. So, so I'm at that point now where I, I've just, I'm not saying I have blinkers on, mm. but I know exactly where I'm going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell us what's new. So, yeah, like <laughs> there's a lot new, <laughs> <laughs> personally and in business stuff. And, but, but no, so we've, um, I'm at, uh, I've gotten to the point now where, um, I've shifted my entire focus to, to healthcare okay. and health technology and um, becoming Africa's biggest health tech company. Cool. That is, that is, that is where we're focusing on now. Um, Do we have a cool name? That's called Inno Health. Inno yeah. Health. Okay, Inno cool. Health, yeah. All right, nice. Yeah. So, so the idea behind it is um, I think South Africa doesn't have much when it comes to health tech. Yeah. Um, the system... Globally, actually, but specifically in South Africa, it's, it's, it's quite archaic yeah. and um, quite far behind if you look at the global market. So for me, with the years working in the space, every single pain point that I've come across for me is an opportunity. And that opportunity is there to improve patient care. Great. Because at the moment, the way things are done, it, it, it is so... Um, it just it just feels backwards sometimes, man. Like, it's not patient centered. It's mm. not value based. It's mm. it's none of those things. Mm. The system is just set up in such a way, to it kind of just carries on the way it is. Mm. Mm. Um, so, and in an environment like that, do you, with what your vision is, because you're the storyteller, um, and looking at like South Africa's healthcare where you want to push in, um, is it? Is it an enabling environment for an entrepreneur? So, historically, the healthcare sector has always been slow to adapt mm. to change, right? And, I mean, that is, that is not a new thing. It's, yeah. been, it's been like that for decades and decades. And if you look at every single industry and how quickly it's been changed, okay. COVID 
literally sped that up tenfold because I think COVID made the healthcare sector realize, okay, we can't, be, we're not prepared for this. Yeah. And um, it's just, it's funny for me because if you think about technology and the way technology has evolved over the years and how quickly things have, have, have evolved in certain sectors, the, every single sector is so deeply entrenched in technology except healthcare. Yeah. You know, yeah. people, people literally think in the ideal world, no, no, you know, all the doctors discuss each other, you know, the yeah. patients and things. We don't. Yeah. Doctors spend 80% of their time writing stuff and doing administrative work, and then the patient gets five minutes of their time. Mm. So all of those things have driven the healthcare sector to realize, okay, maybe it's time for change. Mm. So like in the US, for example, um, the FDA is the ruling body, yeah. and they've now fast-tracked certain things. Yeah, yeah. And in South Africa, for example, we are ruling body SAPRA, and even they've started engaging, you know, more. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. Um, one of the products that I, I, um, I brought to the market um, is called U-Image. Uh, it's a wireless ultrasound. And uh, I managed to get that SAPRA approved in under three months, mm. which was, it was something abnormal, be yeah. because at the time, it usually would take you a year to two years to get something certified. Okay. So there is definitely, in South Africa, there is a shift. And particularly with the NHI coming in now, which is the National Health Insurance, that is, for me, what we are working towards. Mm. So we are aligning ourselves as a company to ensure that we have strategic you know, agreements and partnerships in place to enable um, execution of the NHI okay. and, and, and delivering um, that service okay. um, to people. So, okay. so yeah, we are, we are very forward thinking as a, as a company. Yeah. So what are we looking, I mean, like products wise, or what is it service wise? So interestingly, we, We've, um, we've modeled the company in such a way that we have looked at what ex historically what um, healthcare biotech type mm -hmm. companies have okay. done, and we flipped the switch. Okay. So the company's focus is um, innovation, so research, development, and all of that, and then commercialization. But the research and development is triggered by understanding whether or not this is a viable product yeah. within the market. So you know, in, in, with, with business and, and with things, if there's no margin, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it, you have to be able to monetize the entire thing. Of course, yeah. And historically, that's where healthcare companies have, have, have struggled. So you would plow millions and billions of rand, well, dollars in the US case, but plow it into it, but then the product never sells mm. because it doesn't actually, it's not necessarily needed. Yeah. Um, but the research is important. Yeah. Um, but we've, we've realized that we need to build something that, that you can monetize. So we've taken that, that approach, so the whole commercialization innovation thing, and we focused on, on four key areas. So the one is preventative medicine, yeah. so lifestyle type things. Um, and then there's diagnostics. So okay. diagnostics being um, advanced ways to image and so on. The third thing is um, disease management. Okay. Right? So, so with disease management, there's... Um, that involves remote monitoring of patients yeah. and so just ways in which we can we can make disease monitoring a lot more decentralized and then there's um, one of the other key things is obviously data aggregation and mm -hmm. analysis and, and electronic healthcare records and those kinds of things because those are sort of the key focus points right that we've used to um, where that's where we position all our, our products and our solutions and our services and our mm -hmm. concepts so we look at those key things okay. across the entire human life cycle. So we go from a baby till when they're 75, mm -hmm. and each of those separate segments, all those things mm -hmm. can need, need to be addressed okay. and need to be optimized. So, okay. so that is sort of the premise of our company at the moment. And um, we are, yes, we've repositioned ourselves now um, with certain products now um, uh, to, to really now get going with it. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, we've really been putting a lot of work into getting that all to getting that, yeah. that value chain set up nicely. Yeah. So, so, I mean, what's the average day of Chad? Um, like you said, you have an office and you have a partner, Yeah, so, so. so the average day is actually, so I, I am one of those 5 a.m. club people. I do wake up at five, office 4 sometimes, but 5 o'clock usually. Um, easily or not easily? Very easily. Yes. I jump yes. up. 20, yes. Well, usually, okay, like probably like quarter past 5. Yeah. Yeah. Quarter past 5, I usually, yes. with no alarm, I just, I just wake up. Wow. Um, so I'm up at quarter past five, 
chug a liter of water mm. and then so very interestingly and I think also very critically is um, what I'm going to chat about now is, is about mentorship. Mm. So after I left Paul, so uh, my wife and I, we stayed in Val and uh, I really thought, you know, living there would, would give me a lot of networking opportunities. Like, you know, I really mm. thought it would, mm. it, would, it would unlock that thing. Um, and I was surprised. It, it didn't really. It mm. didn't, it, I didn't engage with it as I, as I thought I would. Yeah. Um, so when I moved to Cape Town, I just, it was like I kicked into another gear because okay. then I realized this is the hustle and bustle. Yeah. I'm good at networking. Let me network. Okay. Um, and uh, I actually launched um, Africa's first digital business card. So it's called uh, Vault Share. Okay. So it's a digital business card that um, it works with NFC. Okay. So you download our app, you buy the card, you set up the app, you pay the card with the app. And then if I'm out and I meet you somewhere, you just tap the back of your phone. Oh, yes, I saw you. Yeah, yeah so um, that was, that whole thing came about the fact that I love networking. And that is, that is I think, the, one of the things I enjoy a lot. Um, anyway, so off the back of that, I remember, so I, I mean, I frequented Cape Town often when I was a student. And one of my friends has a very popular coffee shop called Shift in, in, in Greenpoint. And um, I just said to my wife, no, I'm just going to, you know, go and in, just sit there and work during yeah. the day. I didn't really have a very clear plan as to what I'm going to do just yet. Yeah. I, I sort of took a bit of a sabbatical, if you want to call it that, a few months just to realign my yeah, thoughts. Of and um, I met a very interesting man who was wearing one of, my, one of our masks, one of the nanowave masks. And I walked up to him and I said, that's my mask. Yeah. And he looked at me and then he's like, no shit. And yeah. I was like, yeah. And then we became friends, and now he's somewhat become my mentor. So, okay, cool. So, um, and he's a very, he's a much older gentleman. He's nice. in his fifties and all. And so, like I said, so with the net, the networking thing and the mentorship thing. Yeah. So every single morning at six o'clock, I have coffee with five of my mentors. Okay. Every single morning, um, and these are ranging from owners of uh, pathology labs to CEOs of of multinationals so cool. to yeah. uh, see all of them are CEOs basically. Yeah. So. And it just, we just, it just naturally became a thing that we do. So now every, my wife knows every single morning, six o'clock, I'm at, we have coffee at, at, at shift. And uh, we have coffee for about a half an hour to an hour. And, and the discussions that take place there are invaluable for me of because course, yeah. it's obviously, it's, it's primarily a friendship. Yeah. But through there, you just start picking up all the little things that they, that they, that you, you, you can't not Mm. absorb what mm. they say mm. so i've learned a lot in the last it's just been a few months of you know being with them every single day but i'm, I'm sitting with guys who've built businesses from 2000 rand to a billion rand yeah yeah i'm sitting with guys who are ceos of companies with half a million uh, 500 million to a billion rand turnover mm. per annum mm. you know i'm sitting with guys who have built their own sort of pathology labs and have sold them off to so that's what i'm engaging with now and and through them um, as mentors, I've been able to meet some incredible South African businessmen to the point where I'm having lunch with them on a Saturday. Nice. And who, I, I would never have thought that that would be where I would be now. Mm. But this particular businessman, I remember I was watching his, I was watching videos about him like so much last year. And, and, and then this year I met him. And I mean, I have lunch with him on a Saturday. So yeah. the mentorship thing forms, is like a pivotal thing now. It's, it's like so crucial for me at the moment. Um, and I've just been absorbing everyone I'm around and I'm working with is, is, is minimum 10 years older than me mm. with way more experience mm. than me. So I never, ever try to sound like I know anything, mm. everything. I so literally cool. play, I'm the dumbest person yeah. in the room. That is my role. I just want to be there and just absorb. Okay. Um, so yeah, so after the six o'clock coffee, it's usually a seven o'clock gym. So I go to gym at seven. Um, seven till eight, come home, have my first meal for the day, which is measured out and everything. And then uh, we usually go to the office, in, which is in Platicliff, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so that's where, that's where we're operating from at the moment. Okay, yeah. all right, yeah. cool. Yes, I mean, the, so we have last year as a big lesson year, and it looks like last year has put you on the right track now for this yeah. year because of the lessons. <laughs> yes. Um, so, what's, yeah, so what's happening for 2021? So this year is, is primarily focused on... Um, taking our current business mm. and getting it and solidifying its position in the market. Okay. That is, that is our, that is okay. our goal now. Um, and we've obviously got, you know, short term, long term goals yeah. and all of these things, but 
we've caught the attention of some some big companies cool. and uh, we're engaging we engaging with them daily yes, so yeah and uh, the big dream the big dream yo <laughs> um the big dream is probably to list something on the on the JSC. that's okay. that's sort of one of my and if not the JSC, maybe the, the London Exchange for yeah. the US or the NASDAQ. Or but it's always been a, a, a big dream of mine to, to set up a business where I'm employing the brightest of the bright mm. in a specific field. So, yeah. so me now, if I say I'm focused on health technology or I'm focused on uh, technology that enables networking yeah. or whatever, I want to be able to have people working within my organization that yeah. are absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, and create a work environment that will really um, foster their growth. Mm. Um, so yeah, we're learning a lot about the South African capital markets yeah. and all of that, so how that works, and, and especially in the startup space. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we're really trying to like, reach a new frontier okay. in that space. Yeah. So why would you tell someone not to become an entrepreneur? Yo, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I usually just tell people to try and go, but... <clears throat> no, but I mean with your lessons learned now? Yeah, I'm... I'm thinking if you, the only thing, the only reason I would say not to become one, if, 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 if some people just aren't cut out for it, mm -hmm. it is not for everybody. And um, <clears throat> some people are just genuinely good at working. Like uh, if you have a specific role that someone needs to play, some people are very happy just fulfilling that role. Yeah. And I think I, would, I wouldn't, I'm not someone that says, look, I do advocate a lot for being an entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm I've been trying to get my wife to, move over to that space for a long time. Someone must pay the bills. <laughs> exactly, don't entrepreneurs don't make money. <laughs> yes. We just like sit there and come up with stuff. So, um, so I, I think it really is, if it's, if it's not for you, it won't, you won't yeah. do it. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm always, I'm very pro people just playing to their strengths. That's, okay. that's what I think is, is, is very, very important. Yeah. So, so I would literally, for someone not to start, if it's not in you, it's, mm. it's, it's, then don't do it. Is it a lot of hard work? Or is I've, it just I've a lot of asked, mental work? <clears throat> so, so interestingly, um, so this businessman that I, that, I, that I do the lunches with and things, he actually asked me that exact same question. He asked me, um, so Chad, is it moeilijker? No, as what it was. Mm -hmm. And I think... What, to, what, does, what does that mean, was? When, when I was working full time. Oh, is okay. this harder now than... Okay. than and, and when I think about it, it that's much harder. That's the only way to describe it. Is, it is incredibly difficult because you are solely responsible for whether or not this thing will work or not. No one else is going to, no one really can catch you if it flops or whatever. And I think this is a key lesson also is that as much as school teaches you, no, don't fail, you can't, you must get great marks and all that, I think it's the biggest. It's the biggest sort of mistake our education system mm. has made with, with, with students is that failing is bad. Mm. And it, it is probably the most important thing that will happen to you is failing. I've probably failed. I fail every day, mm. every single day. Mm. If I don't fail, then I'm not doing something right. Yeah. So I love, I feel safer taking risks, but that is my personality. Yeah. Yeah. You see, I feel safe to take the risk. If I look at it and I'm like, if someone says to me, no, no, I'll give you, because I was offered last year, I was offered a, a situation was brought forward where it was going to be, you know, we'll buy X and yeah. you'll, you'll, we'll partner up and we'll fund X, Y, Z. And effectively, I would have sold my soul and would have worked for this person. And for me, I felt riskier doing that. As safe as it sounded, it was for me a risk. Mm. I had to literally go step back and think, no, but I have to do this on my own, in my yeah. own way, and then figure out things after that. Yeah. Um, so, so that is, I think, probably, okay. probably the, the, the biggest thing, yeah. yeah. Um, like we always talk about this thing about purpose. Are you fulfilling your purpose as an entrepreneur? Yeah. And it's like just your life. Yeah, no, I, the, the whole concept of the purpose thing, it, it always makes me a bit like theory because if I think about it, the chances of you living, like being born, Right, in, in any way, shape, or form, is so small. Mm. Right? So the fact that you were born is, is obviously it's a medical. Mm. Right? And me, in my particular case, uh, my parents struggled for many years to have kids. And I was an IVF baby, so I was one of the first sort of non-white non IVFs mm. back in like 1993 or whatever. 
So the whole process for me of, of being born and living life and getting to a point, it wasn't necessarily, I almost died twice. Mm. So like there was a lot that happened along the way. And then I actually came to the point. Did you say I almost died twice? <laughs> 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 so like no, but like it, it happened and, yeah. and, and all those things made me at some point I remember sitting and I'm like what because I remember man I was yeah, I'll never forget I was on call the one night i never forget this actually I haven't said this in a long time but I was on call the one night and I'm sitting in the doctor's room and um, I think it was a surgery call or something it was like half past two in the morning mm. and I'm sitting there on my phone I'm waiting for the patient to come in and stuff and I just looked at the freaking phone and I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, mm. why am I sitting here at three o'clock in the morning mm. on this shift? What, what value, what am I doing? Why am I here? And those kinds of questions used to bother me a lot. Mm. And towards the end of medical school, uh, towards the end of my year at working at, uh, in the state sector and stuff, I went through quite a bad um, depression. And a lot of those things built up over the two years of working there, the lack of sleep, the incredibly yeah. stupid hours and, and all that stuff. Um, and <clears throat> I really just thought about it and I said, no, well, this is not what I'm supposed to be. This is, not, this is definitely not my ceiling. I am not going to sit in a hospital for the rest of my life. And all the thoughts came back and everything. And, and when I, um, at, in 2019, uh, I actually attempted suicide. So... That was quite a... That 2019? Was like, yeah. 29, okay. It was 2019, 2018. 2019, okay. yeah. So it's before the, it's before the masks. Yeah, yeah, before yeah. that and everything. So, so that, that was like a, pivotal, like a pivotal point for me. And I think I realized there that this was almost like a wake-up call and God was like saying to me, like, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You are hitting walls here. And I uh, took the time off, was booked off and everything, and then... Uh, when I came back and I started working, I said, this will be my last month of working as a doctor. And I just made the decision. I just, I just literally jumped off the bridge mm. and made my wings as I flew, as I fell. Like, I just figured things out as I went. Um, I had no clear plan at the time, but I knew, like, I believed in myself that I can you know, make yeah. this entrepreneurship thing work. Yeah. And, yeah, now I genuinely feel like I'm living my purpose. I'm, I'm, I'm innovating in the healthcare space. I'm trying to build something that will make people's lives better mm. and improve patient care um, and improve the way people live and literally just help people live their best life. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's, that's literally where I'm at at the moment. And that's cool, man. Um, I think now with, the, with the, um, the group of guys I'm working with now, mm. I'm seeing it more and more that we all, the, nothing happens by accident. Like you don't meet people by accident, nothing. I, we watched a movie the other day. What did she say? Um, there's no strangers, it's just friends you haven't met yet. Yeah. So, so that kind of thing for me was when I started now engaging with more people and really building solid relationships with new business partners, yeah. I realized like, I'm sure there's a reason like, we came together now. Mm. You know, we're all very skilled, we're all professional, we've got some experience. Mm. We have to, there's a reason we're going to build this thing now. So yeah. so yeah, definitely. Just quickly, I'm just intrigued. How do you get home and you tell your parents, um, I know I studied for so long <laughs> Um, I know you paid for this, and but I've just decided I want to become an entrepreneur. No, it's still Especially good. that generation of, <laughs> of parents. I mean, how, how did that conversation guys last? As a last question. Not very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of flack from my parents. Well, yeah, look, they, I, think, I think to be honest, like, I think it was coming for a while, but okay. I think the, the mental health issue, I think it really made them realize, okay, mm. maybe there's something not okay. Maybe there's something more for him to be doing. Okay. And I think um, after that whole episode, they, they were more supportive. Okay. And, no, but I still get the thing of saying, don't you, yeah. you want to go work at the government again? Yeah. And, you know, all these, it's still there. <laughs> like, it's just, unfortunately, when I wanted those things. Okay. But, you know, more I say to my mom or my dad or whatever, I say to them, no, I'm actually trying to improve the, the, the government healthcare system. Mm. No, but just, you know, go work <laughs> there, man. Just stay. So I get it. And I, I, I do understand why. Yeah, uh, obviously, parents look, they, obviously, they want you the best for you. And they... they when They're I'm fearful for you. They, yeah, yeah. You know, it's hard for your parents to see. You know, my, mom said, my mom was saying, just the stress. You just stress yeah, all the time. Yeah. And, and I understand it. Like, I'd probably be the same. You know, when I have a kid, I'd probably tell him also, nah, like, you know, this yeah. is a safe thing. You know. But I just, I, I'm literally at that point now where I'm 27. I'm, I'm 
you know, still have some time to build something of value. Okay. Uh, I've got a supportive wife and a supportive family and actually very supportive people around me now. Nice. And um, I'm just, I'm focused. My okay. mission is clear. I know what I need to do. So. Nice, yeah. man. Yeah, man. Yo, dude. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, yeah, good luck with the, with the new med space. Yeah, uh, no. It's an interesting space to be. Currently. It is. It very, um, it's very, it really is very, very yeah, much very and, uh, interesting. Yeah, thanks for your time. Normally, we just uh, give the mic to a few people that hide away, and I'll give the mic to them for them to ask you for questions. That's fine if um, anyone wants.